Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today. October has arrived and it is time to pick out the delicious, beautiful, scary pumpkins that will be gracing our dinner tables, our front porches. And so we have uh, a lot to talk about in selecting our pumpkins today. We will get to that topic in just a second. And you know, I'm not doing this by myself. I am joined as always every single week by horticulture educator, Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. You got in your pumpkins yet? Not yet. You see, I get my pumpkins and my kids immediately say, let's carve them. And Carving a pumpkin on October 1st, it is not going to last till October 31st. And so I try to dig my heels in as long as I can, because I know as soon as I do, the the knives come out and um, the pumpkins must be carved. So I, I try to hold off a little bit longer. How about yourself? So we grew some pumpkins this year and um, squash bugs did us in. <laughs> so we don't have any pumpkins, so we will have to go find some somewhere the last couple of years our kids really haven't wanted to carve so we'll see if they want to this year ah you gotta you gotta get those like stencils where you can create all kinds of elaborate designs and stuff and and then the kids get bored about a third of the way through and then you finish it <laughs> actually make it a third of the way through for you <laughs> i almost said a half but i backed <laughs> off to a third yeah well, it sounds like maybe you and I could use some some help, uh, advice from an expert here. So let's bring in our special guest today. We have commercial ag educator Nathan Johanning in Waterloo, Illinois. Nathan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, we are happy to have you. And so let's let's give a bit of context uh, for folks. I've described Macomb. We all know where Jacksonville is. Where's Waterloo in this great state of Illinois? So Waterloo is in the St. Louis Metro East. We're on the south side. So we're just a little bit south of St. Louis on the Illinois side of the river. So uh, perched up atop the uh, river bluffs. So we're, uh, um, yeah, not too far from the metro area, but where we're at, it's a pretty reasonably rural area. Still lots of commuters to the St. Louis uh, work environment, but uh, no, pretty well a rural farming community, at least kind of at its roots. So and lots of uh, lots of little mom and pop uh, pumpkin operations here scattered around. Seems to be, as I'm sure in many areas, popular to see that little uh, wagon at the end of the driveway with a little honor system can and you know a few pumpkins out of different kinds. So Waterloo, so- I mean, sounds like you know we're definitely south to where where Ken and I are are located. Um, and so, but a bit about your background too. I mean, Nathan, you've been on the show before. I think we've talked about pumpkins before a little bit, but some of your background is also in studying things like cover crops um, and, and and how it relates to kind of that pumpkin cropping system. Um, and so, but you've studied pumpkins and cover crops and do you, what, what kind of other research do you do on the farm there? Sure. So, um, so just a little more in depth about my background, especially relating to pumpkins as it is. Um, I've done lots of work through extension on uh, doing pumpkin field days, usually uh, every other year. This is an off year for me. So it gives me time to talk to you guys and not have the insanity of a, of a field day and other things to deal with. Um, and at lots of presentations, you mentioned cover crops. I've done lots of work with no-till pumpkin production. So basically where we're trying to use some conservation practices, trying to preserve our soil, uh, keep it in our fields and not in our rivers and and creeks and drainage ways. Um, So looking at that and some of the benefits there. So in addition to all of this extension work, I also am a pumpkin grower myself. We have a family farm south of Waterloo and uh, I've been growing pumpkins. I think this is now year number 18 that I have on uh, on pumpkin. So it started off with a little bit, maybe a half acre or so and kind of on a whim and uh, with a little bit of previous experience uh, from a summer before helping somebody out. And I thought, I can surely do this. And now 18 years later, we got about five acres of pumpkins <laughs> and, uh, and so just all kinds of fun, I think over 60 different varieties. And uh, what you can see behind me is a shot from one year from our, uh, our pumpkin field at that time. So, so no, that's, uh, 
that's a little bit about me and kind of where I think my role all through extension, but then also through some of the research and uh, as a grower kind of comes into working with pumpkins. So, so you're, you're the guy to talk to. So we're happy to have you here. We have a series of pumpkin questions. So Ken, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off uh, this week, please. All right. First off, how does the pumpkin crop look for 2023? 2023 pumpkin crop. I think overall the pumpkin crop looks pretty good. I think it, it really depends on where you're at. That's uh, rainfall, which is no secret, has been the biggest um, probably issue for the most part, lack of rainfall. Although I know in a few areas, and once it finally did rain, there was excess rain that may have even caused some issues. But at least where we're at here in the southern part of the state, lack of rainfall is probably our biggest uh, deficit as we've you know, I think since about the, oh, probably the end of July, 1st of August, we've had less than a half inch of rain these last two months. And that was going in. We had a brief respite, a little bit of July kind of um, gave us a little bit of rebound with maybe an inch or two, but then we were dry for like three months prior to that. So uh, we've just been uh, really struggling. All of our crops are withered away. I haven't mowed grass and I don't know how many weeks <laughs> Um, and it's brown and crispy, um, which in some ways I don't mind a little bit. It's happy, happy to check that chore off the list. But um, needless to say, things are struggling. Um, and there's various, uh, so that's, a, but if you happen to catch some rain, you might be in a lot better position. I know some growers that uh, had caught a few inches of rain in the last month, uh, not even terribly far north of here, and um, and things look a lot better. Uh, for us, it's uh, I would say overall, it's going to be an average year. Um, and I think across the board, um, the the biggest thing that I think across the board hurt everyone was we were up around, everyone was close to like 100 degrees in the middle of August. We had that really hot stand, one of the last heat waves, biggest heat waves we had. Pumpkins don't like setting fruit when it's super hot. If it go, gets above about 95 degrees, they start uh, basically aborting female flowers, basically meaning that they don't set new fruit when they should be. And given it takes 30 to 40 days for a pumpkin to bloom till maturity, um, the fact that about the middle of August is when we need to be setting a bunch of fruit so they're ready late September for harvest in, in October. So that, um, like many other crops, there's this delayed effect. The weather that happened in August is is dictating our uh, pumpkin harvest now. So pumpkins are, well, I would say, for the most part, kind of an indeterminate crop that continues to bloom once its fruit set starts. But whenever we get windows of, uh, of uh, let's say, adverse weather, like I just mentioned, then you'll see big gaps in fruiting uh, later on because of that. So. Uh, so anyhow, that's that's at least a few observations. But I think the dry weather has really hurt some people. Uh, a few have actually seen we've seen some plant viruses. There are some um, actually uh, plant viruses that can come in. They're aphid vector. They especially love the dry weather because aphids appreciate it. They'll come in and they cause distortion of the leaves and lots of green speckling and spotting on fruit. That's really weird, almost Frankenstein ish. Um, uh, and lots of other kind of subtle issues that are really, um, really hard to manage. There's not really any management to it just due to how they're vectored. So a few growers have some of that and that's, uh, that's frustrating and kind of one of those things that, that happens at our farm. We actually have a lot of that. Um, and that's, that's probably one of the things that's, um, been frustrating me, at least as a grower, but. That being said, some things look great. A couple varieties that had extra sensitivity, those viruses, kind of kind of struggling a little bit. So, but uh, but all in all, given the amount of rain we've had or the lack of, I'm I'm rather impressed with the crop. So, but with viruses, that I mean, like you said, not really any control other than just getting rid of the plant, getting that out of there. Yeah, and and it's um. Yeah, it's just a challenge. Um, even some of that and, you know, to some extent you, um, at least on a larger scale, you're not going to ditch all of those plants because some of them have a few productive fruit they set early, but then they're starting to show symptoms later on the vine. A lot of it will show up 
the leaves, the old leaves look fine, but from whenever that virus hit on, any new growth starts to get distortion or any new fruit that's set. And it's the uh, viruses are a whole interest, interesting topic, plant viruses um, and how they can uh, manifest themselves. But, uh, but yeah, it's definitely something that is really kind of out of the grower's control. There's not even any really good preventative measures you can do um, to help kind of manage it. So. So the the fruit that gets the virus is can you still sell that or does that affect it? So kind of how well it keeps. The biggest thing that affects is its color. So everyone wants the perfectly orange, uh, orange pumpkin fruit that has you know this nice consistent color. What happens is you know sometimes you'll get the viruses can cause the fruit to get a little bit lumpy and also cause these latent green spots. So there's spots that usually pumpkins are green. Well, these spots just stay green when the rest of the fruit is turned orange. So you get these weird patterns. Now for a retail market, actually some people actually find them kind of interesting. Um, and so, uh, and actually we'll, we'll pick them up. Uh, however, if you're, we also sell to some stores and other pieces and there's different levels of accepting of, of some of those uh, dysfunctionalities in a fruit. So they're not, uh, it does, they keep just fine. They otherwise look fine. Uh, otherwise, they're they're it's not something that causes them to rot. They just don't have their normal color. Um, no different than if you had like a mole or something on your. I mean, that's kind of the the, the thought process. It doesn't affect anything. It's just a difference in coloration there. I guess Nathan, speaking of color, I have maybe a two parter here. Um, when I was a kid, I only remember going to the pumpkin patch, and there was like one type of pumpkin. Now. You go to the pumpkin patch and you have an assortment of different pumpkins, gourds, what have you. Um, do you have let's maybe two questions here. Do you have a favorite? And then is there one that sells the best? Um, you know, the pumpkin market has shifted, you know, since I started um, until now. Um, whenever I first started, I had um I did have access and and had started into what we call some of the specialty pumpkins, the reds, the blues, the whites, and other things. Um, certainly, there wasn't as much available. Companies hadn't gotten into really doing lots of breeding or other work around it. Most of what we had early on, and still now, were just um, winter squash that had some unique colorations and had kind of pumpkin-like characteristics as you would look at them. And so we started not just using those for uh, keeping winter uh, food, but we started using for ornamental purposes. And so I think that that, you know, that trend has shifted. It used to be that, oh, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know, a white pumpkin. Ooh. And then now it's like everyone wants like, they go to the the different colored pumpkins and they will just like go haywire. Like that's just what they want. And I think that's kind of where um, at least most of the, uh, you know, you pick stands or other, that's kind of the, the market niche that you can get there. I mean, certainly some of the big box stores, you'll see the, the bin of some assorted things, but nothing, even they're not quite what you can get at some of these local farms that really push the envelope with the number of varieties and stuff they have out there. So for me, um favorite gosh there's so many i still think one of the and this is from the looks and then also the the productivity of that variety there's actually a variety called warty goblin it's a uh, a predominantly orange pumpkin and it has basically green bumps all over it um they'll fade to orange eventually but it's a nice contrasting orange background with green looks like green warts on it um Really nice fruit, just really stands out. Something that people don't see. They think you've like glued stuff onto the pumpkin um, or something you've done to it. And I say, no, it's just just how that variety, uh, how that variety has been uh, bred and how it how it grows. So I think that's probably one of my one of my favorites. It's really productive and and it's probably overall probably one of the one of the better sellers. I don't know. It it shifts even over the last few years. You get some shift of. You know, people have gotten more into like pumpkin stacks and some of the flat pumpkins, like the the Cinderellas, which are reds and and whites, and and some of the blue Jardale, which is a a, a kind of a bluish gray color, and and many others. So there's been lots of shifts, certainly more shift towards those and those types. Uh, and so that's that's probably some of my 
favorite. And I think where the the market is definitely towards that specialty side. People still love uh, love jack o' lantern pumpkins. They'll always they'll get a few of those to slip in. But that's you know definitely the market is going to the different colors, and that's where a lot of our local farms I think um, kind of shine is to be able to give you some of those unique things that you can't find just anywhere. So we've got all these varieties that we can grow. Um, take us through the kind of the process of growing pumpkins. What's kind of the year in the life of a, a pumpkin farmer? So uh, the pumpkin the pumpkin year starts off, um, of course, you get your seeds earlier in the season, but the actual production year will start off. And this is the thing that some people get a little caught up in is usually doesn't start until about June. Maybe if you're in the far northern parts of our area, maybe a little bit of late May for some things. But really, we we push it later than what we would, say, trying to get our other cucurbit crops, our, our first cucumbers and zucchini and things out. Uh, the main reason for that is that um, very few people really have an appreciation for July pumpkins. Um, and the other side to that is that pumpkins that mature in some of that excessive heat in the middle of July just tend to not keep as well. You have a lot longer. I mean, even though in the fall, you can get them to keep when temperatures cool off, but it can be hard to grow a good pumpkin and get it to actually keep if it's mature in the middle of July all the way until, you know, even early September. So um, usually we start our, get pumpkin started uh, sometime in mid-June. Actually in this area down here, you can actually push even a little bit later um, as you head a little bit further south, but somewhere in the month of June is a good month to, uh, is a good month to start. You're gonna plant seeds. We actually um, we actually transplant ours, so we grow little plugs and 72 cell trays and use a mechanical transplanter that can handle no-till conditions and plant them out. A, a few growers do that. A lot of them use uh, just direct seed with some kind of a modified corn planter. Um, sometimes even just hand planters, or just use a hoe and make little uh, hills and plant. So, um, so that you know we're starting off with planting. Those plants get up. Uh, the biggest thing we're watching for, just trying to keep all the weeds out, uh, watching for uh, any diseases. Um, you know, powdery mildew is probably our most common year in, year out. We get powdery mildew, looks kind of like almost powdered sugar kind of spots on the leaves. They'll start to come in. And once they hit, uh, at a certain point, it kind of goes to like pandemic level and just whoosh, spreads across the field uh, if, you, if you don't do anything else. And I would say that Almost every year, you know, every, you know, uh, any field with cucurbits that are planted most of the season is going to have some level of of powdery mildew in it, especially unless you've had a, you know, extremely good preventative fungicide program. But that's um, that that's one crop that problem that's common and we're always watching for. Um, and it's just a factor of our our kind of hot, humid summers. It uh, loves dry as far as limited precipitation, but high humidity and high temperatures. So that's pretty much most summers in Illinois. So from there, um, you know, we're watching for insects too. Um, Ken, you mentioned squash bugs. Squash bugs are, are you know, like public enemy number one, right, right up there with cucumber beetles. Um, they will do a number on them. Cucumber beetles actually aren't quite as problematic. They're a little easy to manage, a uh, little bit easier. Squash bugs are just tough, um, especially the adults. If you look at them, they're very armored. They're gray. They they look like little miniature tanks, like, you know, running through your, your pumpkin field to destroy them. You know, they're all kind of armored up. Uh, and so they, um, you'll see some of the squash bug eggs sometimes early. They're little like kind of, uh, Oh, kind of a reddish orange little spots on the underside of the leaf that look like little uh, little drops hanging there, usually in clusters of maybe a, a dozen or more. Um, once those come, you know, after a little bit, those start to hatch. You'll see these little gray nymphs running around. I actually saw some in my field, which gave me increased my blood pressure a little bit whenever I saw a good number of them as I'm like trying to like stomp on them and other things and contemplating my plan of attack. Um but uh, but yeah, those are pretty biggest things. And uh, cucumber beetles feed a lot on leaves. Sometimes they'll kind of feed on green fruit. They're kind of minimal. They fly around. They look like little green, uh, little ladybugs that are green instead of red in their background. Um, you can tolerate some of them, but the squash bugs will get into, a lot of them will be at the base of the plants. They'll start basically 
basically sucking the life out of the plant, uh, sucking that sap. And just you'll see plants that start to wilt and they just literally they're just, you know, sucking that uh, basically all the nutrition from that plant to the point that that plant just kind of succumbs earlier than it should. Um, what happens sometimes with that, depending on your the maturity of your pumpkins, is you'll get um, you'll end up having um, fruit that mature, but they don't get they don't really get ripe. They'll get this kind of pale yellow color. The stems kind of shrink up, and even the fruit will kind of get shrunken. They get kind of soft, and basically, what's happened is that fruit is. Um, uh, that fruit was green. It wasn't really physiologically mature as, as, as it should be. It needed more time on the vine. The plant died. Its na natural instinct and through the plant hormones is to go ahead and change colors, but it's really not a ripe pumpkin. And because of that, it doesn't have that tough outer skin and the durability that it really needs to hold up. And that's why those pumpkins sometimes when you do have that um, happen, you pick those pumpkins and they look kind of okay. And then they just kind of rot and shrivel up and they just don't hold up. So those are all probably the biggest, you know, the biggest pest things we're looking at mid-season. Then we go on, um, you know, later in the season, we're just, you know, watching for fruit set, you know, trying to, you know, make sure hopefully, you know, supporting our pollinators, wanting to encourage them to come to our pumpkins. Um, and then from there, it's just kind of monitoring, um, you know, a lot of which, so I mentioned there are pests. Common things we'll do is, you know, spray preventative fungicides. No one wants to. It costs a lot of money, but especially things like powdery mildew um, can just kind of ruin the quality of a pumpkin crop. And very few customers appreciate that small, shrunken, you know, ugly looking pumpkin, which is why, you know, we try to keep those plants healthy. I always, any pumpkins that I pick, I want to pick them off of a green, you know, healthy vine. You know, I, I don't want to, some people think that that field should be all brown, like the leaves all down. You should see all the pumpkins. Some, my ideal is that I should almost be a, a jungle of leaves I have to wade through uh, to find the pumpkins. There's a happy medium there because that can get old when you're just hunting for pumpkin after pumpkin, you know, acre by acre. But, um, but no, it's, um, you're just wanting to keep those vines healthy, keep the diseases and keep those insects at bay. Now, I'm I'm kind of a uh, you know I I try to practice my integrated pest management as far as trying to balance things. I I scout and if I don't see anything, I tend to hold out on making any sprays. So you know I think this year if I maybe made maybe two fungicide sprays and I think I'm pretty well good. Um, I maybe make one strategic insecticide spray and I think with I mentioned those squash bugs, there may be another one just because my tolerance for squash bugs and what they do is not, uh, not very high, but anyhow, <laughs> but um, everyone's tolerance for squash bugs is very, very low. If you've ever grown a pumpkin before, you know, you know yeah. how awful they are. No. And so, um, yeah, no, that's, that's the biggest things. Then you're just looking towards harvest. So we, uh, you know, when a harvest comes, people ask, you know, how do you get all these nice stems? You know, we cut all of our stems. I have a, uh, I have a really nice, a uh, pair of uh, of hand pruners that open real wide that I use. Some people use larger loppers. Um, I'm very biased, and I have my favorite brand and pair that I use, and uh, and so that's my tried and trusty. It's worn. It's probably heck. It's probably in my pocket right now. Um, it's got its little holster, and they we go through and we you know cut them nice and clean. Always keep the stems as long as they can. Uh, there's so many varieties have lots of character in the stem and that really makes the fruit. And I always tell people, people, when they first start, I had a, a friend that helped me once pick pumpkins. We loaded them into a wagon. Every pumpkin I heard, I heard it picked it up and I heard a, a roll and a crunch. And I was just like, after about five or six of those trying to be nice, I said, um, you know, those stems on the top, those are pretty important because they're pretty well worthless without them. And he's like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so we had a little we had a little discussion about the importance of that. And so there's nothing that breaks my heart more than I can I can tell it from like a half mile away is the sound of a pumpkin stem getting crushed. Mm -hmm. A little piece yeah. of my soul dies every time that happens. So. Lift from the bottom. Yeah, yes, from the bottom. From the bottom. And there for the for the and I'm I shouldn't say pros, but for the pros, there are ways that you can uh, you can handle a pumpkin by the stem. It's more of them rolling and self-destructing whenever you're trying to put them into like their truck or something that uh, there's nothing worse 
for about three pumpkins than a wide open truck bed and a 10 mile ride home on a country road. They'll be all over 10 different directions this Sunday. Mm -hmm. Better that truck. <laughs> and if you have any stems left, you're a mighty good driver. Uh, smooth roads. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no curves. Uh, so we, we've talked squash bug. Would you say that's the most difficult pest to manage for a pumpkin patch? Or would, could, would downy mildew be a contender? So, um, so downy mildew is another, uh, another one. Um, I didn't mention it. So the nice thing, if there is a nice thing about downy mildew is that it is not a annual occurrence. It has, it doesn't overwinter here. So it has to blow up from usually for us down South. If you get a little further North or in the Chicago land area, sometimes it'll overwinter in some greenhouse cucumber production up in the, you know, Michigan, New York area and kind of migrate around a little bit. But for most of us, it's got to blow up from some uh, some kind of cucurbit production down further south. Um, it is when it does uh, affect fruit, it is it is pretty devastating. It's it'll basically takes down the leaves and just kind of kind of defoliates the pumpkins prematurely. And then you know we already talked about your vines aren't healthy, your pumpkins aren't healthy. So <laughs> um, so and pumpkin quality goes down. So yeah, downy mildew certainly can be. But I say the saving grace is that um, you know it's been I think it's been maybe I want to say three years since we've had downy mildew to any great extent. So I would say maybe maybe two to three out of 10 years, at least to be a little bit conservative would be, you know, the occurrence we may see it. And sometimes it's a little less than that. So, okay. um, but certainly midsummer there, I get, I don't know how many text messages I got from, and pictures of pumpkin leaves. Is this downy mildew? Is this downy mildew? Is this downy mildew? Um, and Half I, of them I were for me. No, <laughs> because the early symptoms are the leaves start to turn yellow and then they, they, they'll just die prematurely. Well, in drought conditions, when they can't get, water they also the old leaves turn brown and or turn yellow and they start to die which is is not disease related it's it's uh, related to other things there's some minor nuances and differences that kind of distinguish it some of which i have a hard time even telling but uh, but needless to say to to date i haven't heard of any downy mildew in illinois for this season so that's a positive that i can always appreciate okay well so, so back to the squash bug, and yep. I will throw in squash vine borer as as one of my nemesis as well. Um, so I read from MU Extension the maybe the technique of trap cropping some of these insects. Uh, it seems like they're attracted to some older types of squash, like blue hubbard. Um, is that a technique recommended in Illinois to to utilize squash like blue hubbard to? draw the squash bugs or squash vine borers in and then i think like you probably have to chemically treat that plant right to to kill them is that a viable alternative for us uh, it does have some viability so i'll give you an example of that and uh that i actually use this year um so i plant a lot of those older varieties so things like your blue hubbard blue gerardale um any um there's a whole group of family. It's in the the cucurbita muschata, or excuse me, maxima family. Um, they're all the round stem, the winter squash types that we see. A lot of white pumpkins, etc. So those are um, those are a really good culprit, especially for cucumber beetles. Cucumber beetle love beetles love them. I don't know about vine borers and squash bugs. I guess I haven't tracked them quite as well. I think they're a little more um, nondescript in their in their palate. But uh, cucumber beetles will flock to those varieties if given the opportunity, you know, given the the chance. So I somewhat out of uh, logistical organization, I block all my varieties together. So that way, when I'm harvesting, you know, some are separated. And it's a lot of what we pick is we pick off the farm and then take it to farmers markets or, or to stores. So I don't want a. a, a a scattering of everything all mixed together. I want to know exactly where I can find variety X so I can go to it, pick what I need and move on to the next thing. Because of that, all those I tend to group together. And so what I did, I held out as long as I could, but at the point, and I'm sure we've all seen this, whenever you go out, especially with those varieties, and I literally walk through those areas and it's just like a cloud of cucumber beetles. They just start flying up literally by the dozens, if not hundreds, everywhere you go. Um, then you, then I, if actually a little before that, but, uh, you know, that 
you know, it's time. So what I did, you know, we have five acres um, and I sprayed about an acre and a half and I just sprayed those areas. I didn't, I left all, I mean, I, I had ladybugs out, so I'm trying to um, relent and not do anything. But my solution was I'm only going to spray, you know, those areas first. Now later the squash bugs are come in. So usually at least once a year, I have to spray the whole thing. But um, we really try to encourage growers and they're on that is that there was an old mentality of, well, I, you know, I need to spray preventive fungicides, which they often will do weekly during the, the prime, especially August season. Well, I may as well just throw an insecticide in too. And no, you really don't need to. You know, if you if you're not if you're not seeing many and even just a few cucumber beetles, they really are innocent. Like I say, when they hit that epidemic level, you know, then then the cucumber beetles need to be reined back in. Um, squash bugs the same way. If you just because you see one out there. Um, you can tolerate a little bit, although I will say the threshold for those is a lot lower than what cucumber beetles are because they are harder to control and manage. So, uh, so yeah, if that answers your question, there mm -hmm. there is a very distinct um, attraction, especially for cucumber beetles, to those. And they'll be in those. You can manage them there uh, and then, um, you know, you know, basically kind of trap them in there manage them and then not have to worry about them quite as much in your other areas. They, you're not, that's not going to be a hundred percent, but you can gather, you can really knock the population down to a lot more manageable level. So we, we've talked about the importance of stems on the pumpkin, but say people are going out to the pumpkin patch, going to the store buying pumpkins. Um, what should they look for when they're picking pumpkins and, and what's the best way to store them until you want to carve them or, or use them otherwise? So for me, no matter where you're going, you know, I like to um, look over the fruit. Um, certainly, if you're on the farm, you know, trying to look at the stem and hopefully it's, you know, cut and not uh, it should be um, it should still be even if it's dry, it should be kind of firm and not all soft and squishy. The fruit itself, of course, should be firm. If the fruit feels kind of spongy like. You know, that's not that's not a good year off to a bad start to just to start with. Look for any major blemishes, especially if it's in happens to be in a box store or something. No big bruises or gashes in it, anything like that. Overall, um, a pumpkin that the fruit is healthy, doesn't have any spots or rotten spots or other things on it, usually will keep pretty well without a lot of extra um, effort or anything. The biggest things once you get them home um if you put them out in the direct sun, sometimes, for one thing, the color may fade a little bit, but some varieties, a little bit more than others, are very susceptible to sun scald or sunburn, even after harvest. Um, basically, that sunny side just gets a little bit of an off color to it, and no, no different than if one of us um, you know, got a really bad sunburn, and then it just kind of, uh, that spot, basically, it weakens the cells, then it opens up uh, for other infections. And so it'll just get kind of soft on that sunny side and then kind of goes downhill. So um, that's uh, that's probably some of the biggest things I see is, you know, if, if pumpkins sit out in the intense direct sun. Um, worse, whenever we have, I think it was, I don't think it was last year, the year before, there was a, a fall where we had that it literally stayed in the 90s up until like, the middle or latter part of October, like September was like 90, 95 degrees. Even the first week, of October, it was, it was like summer, like temperatures usually, which we have now is more, you know, some seventies and eighties, maybe even a few cooler days in September. And at that point, our, our light intensity and heat tends to, tends to be such as not such a big deal. But if we get some intense heat that rolls through and you got pumpkins that are sitting out in the sun, especially um, no different than sun scald on any of our fruit. If for, if that pumpkin was in a really dense canopy of leaves and that's where it developed, um, it tends to be you know a little more uh, a little more problematic with some of the sun scald. Probably I'm just going to go on a limb here. No different than if if all three of us went outside on the beach without any shirt on. I'm guessing we would probably be uh, toasty lobsters, and that's kind of what those pumpkins feel the same way. So. Well, Ken is the variety that's that sunburns the most. I think. Yeah, I say yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When we talk about we've we've got our pumpkins and and we've used them, and unfortunately, a lot of us don't eat our pumpkins. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, we use the jack o' lanterns, we carve them, we have fun with them, or they're decorative. Uh, you can't eat them. That is something you could do. Um, but 
disposing of pumpkins like millions of people buy pumpkins that means at the end of the season we have to deal with millions of pumpkins um our local parks department they've had kind of a, a rash of every fall now they have just pumpkins in their parks on trails on roadways um, people just dumping them where they really shouldn't be do you have any tips for what we should do with our pumpkins when we're done with them um, I mean, obviously, some a little bit of it depends on your individual situation as far as, you know, especially if you're in an apartment or something else, uh, you know, that can be a little more challenging. Certainly, tr uh, the last thing you really want to do is just to throw them in the garbage. Most of our, our garbage systems, any that I've worked with or know, don't want any kind of plant materials in a pumpkin, not even though it's not a house plant or leaf clippings or, or leaves it's um it's a plant material right so we want we really ideally want that to go to like a facility that takes compost you know if you're in a municipality where they pick up um you know other uh leaves and sticks and other things i would certainly inquire to see if they would take pumpkins most of those go to be composted and i don't really um i would think that most of those would be no different than any other plant materials that they're compost um uh, i couldn't see i could maybe conceive a few places may have some thoughts but that would be one thing to do otherwise if you do have especially a yard or a garden area uh feel free to you know leave it out um uh, you can if you don't mind the wildlife coming up a lot of things will you know will eat on them they can they'll naturally just freeze kind of melt down into uh you know basically a pile of mush and you really won't notice them too much in the spring do do be wary though of course of volunteer pumpkins because there's mm -hmm. the, never so many of the tale of i threw the pumpkins out back and the next year i have all these you know all these pumpkins uh coming up so just be mindful where you put them nothing that can't be managed Mm -hmm. um but uh you know yeah can consider that or use it to your advantage for that matter so uh but uh i mean that's that's certainly a few thoughts remember it is a plant material so let's uh you know it's it'll naturally compost and turn into some 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 really nice uh recycle those nutrients that those pumpkin growers gave you turn them back into your garden flower beds wherever um, or try to find some place that, you know, we'll take and compost them. I know just for us, any any extras we have, we have kind of a compost pile. We have sometimes we'll even just put them back in the field so they can just naturally, you know, decay and those nutrients just kind of go back uh, in for the next uh, next crop to come through. So, yeah, that's probably where I would would lean towards. But remember also, you mentioned the, the edible side. There's lots of things. Almost all of those specialty pumpkins have some edible purposes. So the blue Jaredales are probably one of the, the culinary favorites by many, although there's lots of favorites in there. Um, they can be roasted, fried. Um, there's many of them that could be, you know, baked and scooped out to turn into pumpkin breads and butters and other things. So um, certainly that is... Uh, that is a really good option as well to think about. So remember that because a lot of people, more and more people do uh, do ask about that than what they used to. But still, I know a lot of them. It is it is decorative, and that's mm -hmm. that's fine too. So, well, uh, just uh, promotion here. Uh, a lot of extension uh, offices around the state are hosting a pumpkin smash uh, in partnership with the Illinois group called Scarce. So here where I'm at in Macomb and McDonough County, we are going to have a pumpkin smash on November 4th. So anyone can bring their Halloween pumpkins uh, the Saturday after Halloween to Veterans Park. And we have all these different uh, uh, methods to smash pumpkins. And then they will go in a dumpster and uh, Better Earth Composting and Peoria is going to take them and compost them for us. And so uh, check it out. We got one in McDonough County. I know McLean, Lake, Cook, DuPage, and McHenry all also have pumpkin smashes. So uh, check it out. Uh, we'll I'll put uh, a link below here in the, for an event. You know, so if you're leaving your pumpkins out uh, to just rot on their own, take them off your porch first. Yes, do. Yes. Do, <laughs> yes do. Stay in your I porch. Mention, like, <laughs> yard, garden, um, somewhere that you don't mind. Because, yeah, they, um, they, yeah, don't leave them on your porch. They can, they can leave some nice little stains in the concrete and other things and not, not real pretty. And get them off your porch before it freezes, before they freeze solid. They'll handle... The upper 20s a little bit, uh, a little protection, maybe, you know, on the porch or something, maybe a little more. But at a certain point, and once you've seen it, you'll kind of know it that, yeah, they need to move because they're going to uh, that <laughs> pumpkin stack starting to lean a little bit. And um, that's a telltale sign that that's time to time to get them before they thaw out. And you have a big mess in your hands. You're getting the snow shovel out. <laughs> no. 
Yep, been there, done that. Yep. <laughs> Me too. Yes. Yep. It's not fun. <laughs> All right. Our last question for you is maybe the most important question. Most controversial. <laughs> that too. What are your thoughts on pumpkin spice everything? You know, I am not a terribly big pumpkin spice person. I will say that personally, my biggest um, my biggest probably pet peeve, I do not like cloves. Anytime I make anything with, with pumpkin, uh, any pumpkin products, the cloves is always left out of it. For the cloves lovers, I apologize. That's just my own palate. I'm uh, so, you know, a little cinnamon nutmeg, maybe a little ginger in there. It's good to go. But anything beyond that's just uh, just not necessary. So I'm I'm kind of a purist when it comes to the pumpkin. Like I like the true pumpkin flavor. If you have a really good pumpkin, you don't need to to spice it up with all this stuff. You really just need you just need to taste the pumpkin, a little cinnamon, a little bit of nutmeg in there. And you can just enhance things. If you have too much pumpkin spice, you're just covering up some other other insufficiencies there. That's it's really just unnecessary. So, yeah. And from there, like I like that pumpkin side. So whether it be the pumpkin spice beer, the lattes or whatever, it really it's it's more about the spice than the pumpkin. And I'm more about the pumpkin than the spice. So, yeah, that's pretty where pretty where how where I fall with that. How about you guys? Ken, I could see you being a big pumpkin spice person. No, I am, I'm not a pumpkin spice person. <laughs> he loves it. He's got like 10 cups of pumpkin spice coffee on his desk right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I'm in the same boat too, Nathan. I um I I, I don't quite I, I'm not a big pumpkin flavor person. I actually got like a sampler pack of uh, a, a local craft beer and they had pumpkin flavor in it. I like pumpkin ale. This was like pumpkin pie beer and it had that pumpkin spice in there. And I'm just like, I will drink this, but I'm not going to enjoy it. Um, it. It was, it's a little rough for me. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I'd say I don't the cloves is usually what tends to everyone, you know, that's tends to be the the predominant thing. At least that's what my oh, I tend to taste first whenever I hit some of those. And they're not, yeah, again, it's not about the pumpkin so much as about the spice. And mm -hmm. this is like, I don't know, it just doesn't do it for me. There's lots of other other fall ways I would uh would include. So another thing, just as an aside on the consumption, um I think of is that we do have some varieties and the, one of the varieties you guys can find is called naked bear that uh, if you like pumpkin seeds naked bear is actually a hullless seed variety so if you've seen like the little green seed pumpkin yeah. seeds you do you tend to see um a little more prevalent sometimes in granolas or other things like that you can actually grow those they're a nice little i don't know maybe uh three four or five pound pumpkin um really packed with seeds you know roast those seeds we i, I always grow a few of them and um We'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll have a whole roast, a whole batch of seeds. I get, get the whole family in there trying to pick pumpkin seeds out and we'll just chop the pumpkins in half, pull the seeds out, ditch the rest of them. Uh, the flesh isn't really particularly good. I think you could maybe make pies out of it, but there's better pumpkins for that. Um, and no, we'll, um, we'll roast up those seeds and boy, I don't know, that's almost better than popcorn. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's another just another sideline thing that's um, and of course, just general roasted pumpkin seeds in general. But the 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 hullest ones, uh, some people are like, oh, they don't like the hull and that extra crunchiness and stuff. But try those uh, try those hullest pumpkin seeds and um, yeah, you'll make you a believer out of them. So. They're yeah, I agree. They're not the, they're not the best pie. Pump. We grew them one year. Uh, yeah. Try them as pie pumpkins, too, and they're not. They're OK, but. Yeah, there's, they're definitely better. Yeah. Yeah, I know the, the seeds are good. The The flesh isn't really much to, you know, it's just like an average jack-o'-lantern kind of flesh to them. But yeah, no, they're, uh, the seeds are are uh, definitely a treat. So but yeah, the pumpkin spice. Yeah, I know. Uh, I applaud those that love it um, in whatever form it comes. But yeah, not, I think we're all kind of agreement on that one. We can have a unanimous, unanimous vote on mm -hmm. uh pumpkin spice can stay at home so well, we, we've had many debates over fall flavors on for the good growing before and we'll put a link before and uh, uh about apple versus pumpkin uh down below and there's actually a, a little survey that people can take apple versus pumpkin um surprisingly butter wins all of it so it just makes everything taste better so this is true mm -hmm. this, is, this is very true yeah the apple versus pumpkin that's kind of a tough one there's some 
I like a little bit of both. There's definitely a good, uh, if nothing else, a good crisp apple right now. I picked up some uh, uh, Crimson Crisp the other day from a little orchard. Mm, those stuff. are good. That's that's one of the best. I love Crimson Crisp. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But anyhow, we don't need to get off on apples. This is a nah. pumpkin discussion. What are we Hell, doing? Yeah, here? hang on. Hang on. We're getting off the rails here, guys. Yeah, this, this is, is out, this of is control. out of control. So can rein <laughs> us in. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a lot of great information about pumpkins. Um, I we're, We have a lot of information to put down below uh, in the show notes. So so check that out. Uh, the Good One Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, edited this week by me, Chris Enroth. A special thank you to... Uh, Nathan, uh, for being here with us today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Nathan. Um, and best of luck. Have fun on your upcoming time off with your new little one. So we, we do appreciate you carving out time to talk, talk with us. No problem. I, I always enjoy talking pumpkins and, of course, being love being on the podcast with you guys. So thanks again for the opportunity. Yes. Thank and, you, Nathan. Enjoyed it. And uh, Chris, let's do this again next week. Oh, we will do this again next week. We will be talking once again with Emmy Zweihart about water conservation or kind of a water-wise landscape. And what does that mean? What does that look like here in Illinois? And that should be a fun show. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.